Today we're going to talk about Boris Johnson. He's the British Prime Minister. And what happens is this. He had a birthday party, and it went against all the rules that the British government has set up that said you can't have more than two people in one spot. You can't have uh, specific things happening. But apparently he's uh, been questioned about having broken a lot of the rules in that as well. Now, the guy who's tattling on him or, or getting after him for it is this guy, um, Dominic Cummins. And we did an episode on him uh, a little while back, and we found him to be, um, I think, fairly honest. Isn't that what we, we came up with, you guys? Yep. Yeah, 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 we found him yep, to be sure. yeah, fairly honest. So uh, it's going to be kind of questionable in here. It's going to be a little bit tough. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to yeah, see just today? A, just a few other points. You don't need a whole lot more. <clears throat> it's not just one time. There are many times that this has come up, at least two and maybe a third that they're poking on him about. The interviewer is pretty direct. Did you? Are you calling this person a liar? So you'll enjoy that. The biggest part of this is we someone asked, many someones from the UK asked by direct message, by email, by lots of things, could you look at this video? So it's one of those places we want to look at a politician. And as we say, we look at murderers, politicians and other liars. Just to be clear, then you're saying that Dominic Cummins is lying and his version of events is not true. What I'm what I'm I just repeat, I, I, I deeply sorry for mistakes. I know, that were but made, are you but... saying that he's lying and his version of events? It's very important. Viewers will want to know. The public will want to know. Mean, MPs will want to of know. Course, of course. He is on the record saying under oath, you are lying, that you were warned about this event and you went ahead anyway, that you knew that I can it tell was, you it was dodgy. Categorically, that nobody told me and nobody, nobody said that uh, this was something that was against the rules, that was a breach of the of the COVID rules, that we were doing something that wasn't a, a work event, because, uh, frankly, I don't think, uh, I can't imagine why on earth it would have gone ahead or why it would have been allowed uh, to go ahead. I, my, my memory of this event, as I've said, is going out into the garden for about 25 minutes for what I implicitly thought was a, uh, a work event uh, and talking to staff, thanking staff, um, I, I, I can't remember exactly how many, but for about 25 minutes I was there. I then went back to my, uh, my office and continued my work. Um, you know, I, I do humbly apologize to people for uh, misjudgments that were made, but that is the, the very, very best of my recollection about this event. That's what I've, uh, I've said to, to the inquiry. We'll have to see what they, what they say. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, when he starts off, he's saying, first of all, he starts to say, well, I'm, she says, are you saying, and he's not saying much. He starts to stammer and stutter because his brain goes out of gear. One of the things we always say is stress like that, that immediately shot to the brow or, or to that immediate shot. So you're going to have to make a, a declaration that Dominic Cummings is lying, makes him go Oop, and take a step back. So that shot across the bow makes his brain go into stammer, stutter. He moves back. He doesn't say much. And then when he does, he does an emotional eye accessing cue, as he says, categorically. Interestingly, because most of the rest of the time, he's got glued eye contact. He does that taffy pull because he's making a lot of eye contact to see how he's being perceived. He does that romance for the entire time. His head will move around, his eyes are not. And then his lips appear, you can't tell because the mask, which is a great reason to do this video. His lips appear to purse at you were lying. You see something push up and it's hard to control your face in a way that causes that to happen otherwise. He's got his hands behind his back. Someone's coached him to keep his hands down and not move them because then you're leaking information. But I think this is a really good one. And you can see that when she's saying, you know, how people feel, there's a little bit of recognition. He does a little recognition with his head. And my favorite of the entire thing is as he's moving into this, he then starts the beginning of his message. I got to get back to work. And he's doing what Bill Clinton did at the end of his denial of Monica Lewinsky. Now, I got work to do for American people. I got to get back to work. So he's talking that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, OK, so let's uh, let's uh, join in with uh, Operation Save Big Dog. In fact, the dogs are barking around me right now. You maybe can, can hear them. Uh, so uh, the big dog uh, here is doing something that Peach, my dog, often does, which is to roll the ball along, just nudge it along a little bit now my dog peach does it because she wants you to join in she's going do you want to play are you, are you joining in with me the big dog here is doing it because he wants to roll the message along he's going can we move on can we move on he does this uh i think certainly twice and, and try to try and knock the idea into the long grass 
as it were, make it disappear. And he's going to knock this into the long grass uh, many, many times. So this this problem disappears. Now, when pressed by uh, Beth Rigby, who's doing the interviewing here, who is strong, really strong and really pins him down. Um, when pressed, he, he juts forward with this idea of work event. So we start to get an idea early on that this is going to be his his out that it's a, a work event and and that is I- implicit in all of this and that that has some different rules than some kind of social event so he wants to push the idea of work event rather than social event that's his argument about a dozen times i would say we get a single shoulder shrug out of him now he has uh, been coached most likely to lock himself down like this. Two good reasons for that. You, the public, can't see his hands moving, so he's going to leak less information. Also, this is a stress position as well, and he can create some of his own stress around that. And so when he's under stress, at least part of his brain is going, well, you're you're kind of responsible for a lot of this anyway. He can feel in command in in his own agency of some of the stress. Uh, But even so, it's not enough that we can't see a bunch of single shrugs there, which would suggest that he's not quite certain of what he's saying. And I'll let you decide what you think somebody might be doing if they're not quite certain of the facts that they're giving. Uh, But Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, I think there's, there's a part of this hands behind back that harkens back to me and watching my friends in elementary school get lectured or yelled at by a teacher. And that's the position we would take as little boys getting in trouble. So getting dressed down, uh, so to speak. So I think that's pretty interesting. And I think you should be extremely suspicious when anybody is unable or unwilling to call someone else a liar if they've said something that isn't true about them. Again, here in this video, there's an eye flutter where the eyes are are shuttering rapidly for a very short, brief time, which we don't factor into a high blink rate. That would be a kind of a different thing. But this eye flutter um, and avoidance during these critical points of denials throughout this, there's one major one. You'll be able to spot it when the video comes back up. But then there's mistakes that were made. There's no ownership. He's not taking actual ownership of anything going on here. And he's saying, no one told me Uh, details are changed. And I think he was warned, but I think he's being honest that no one told him specifically what he said because those precise words were not used. So all he's denying is they didn't tell me this specific piece of information. So that's probably honest, but they did tell him about it. I, I would say based on the behavior here. So when, when somebody's argument kind of defaults to memory, of an event, or I, I would I would remember if that was told to me, you've got a problem. So think of your own memory just for a second. You're just going to say what happened. So if I ask what you did yesterday, you're not going to say, well, according to my memory, or as I recall, or anything like that, you're just going to say, I went to the mall, or I went outside, or I mowed the yard. Because memory is implied unless it's being forced into the conversation, which is happening here. So We don't need to say according to memory because everything that you will ever say about your life is according to memory. So I think we're starting to see his theme here, which is misjudgment. And so everybody who's guilty will start revealing their psychological themes that are in their head for why they're innocent very early on. And if you're an interrogator, once this gets revealed, you use this to basically trap that person a little bit later in the interrogation. That's all I got on this one. Mark. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, Scott, I'm sorry, man. Okay, that was cool. I was waiting. I was waiting for you to call somebody else. They were going to eat you alive. All right. Uh, I agree with Chase. That's um, uh, 
the, the, I'll focus more on what we're seeing body language wise. However, one of the things he does go back to is that his prepared statement. I think he's ready for this. That's why he goes back to that every time he, that head goes down, his eyes go down and he regulates by that's his form of regulation by saying, hang on just a minute. He looks down, starts talking and tries to talk over her when she starts uh, t- asking more questions. So I think that's a regulator at that point. But he's got that message prepared. He knows the points he wants to hit. He's hits the same ones almost every video where, where, that we go through here. Now, his head shakes, a lot of times people will say, oh, when somebody's shaking their head, it always means no, even when they're saying yes. There are also head shakes that are confirmation shakes. Like when you say, oh, she's the sweetest thing in the whole wide world. I'd love her dad. My wife is the sweetest thing. So when you say that, or that's the cutest little dog I've ever seen, those are confirmation uh, shakes. You get the confirmation nods as well, which some people will be saying no, but they're saying, no, I didn't do it. Instead of saying, no, I didn't do it, which would be a, a smaller head shake and it wouldn't be as as pronounced. So you can uh, a lot of times make a mistake by thinking the no means um, no when they're actually trying to confirm something. The little head, t- head tilt and um, the eyes up that's or the eyebrows up, that shows he's listening and he's agreeing and his head is, is nodding. So he's showing he's listening and agreeing. And when he says uh, mistakes were made and uh, misjudgments, that could be an embedded confession there because he's pretty much saying, yeah, I, I messed up. I, I did. I was wrong in what I did. So we'll run down this line of seeing him try to balance across that tight wire, a tight rope as he go, as he gets questioned on this. Um, we see a lot of, of conflicting things as well because we're seeing this agreement as we're seeing him um, just disagree with what she's saying. I agree with you, Chase. I think I think somebody um said don't do it but they didn't use those words they didn't tell him those words so and it's probably Cummins you know because who, who knows um but then he, he ducks that head again and he goes right back into to to redirecting the the uh question and uh which he does a uh, he what, what he thinks is a beautiful job of redirect here later on chef redirect but it's hilarious but the whole thing the whole this whole thing is right it's it's, it's based on um these certain points he hits and he hits them as he's jutting his head going back to what mark was talking about get those head juts as his illustrators all right that's what i got just to be clear then you're saying that dominic cummins is lying and his version of events is not true what i'm what i'm i just repeat i i i deeply sorry for mistakes I know, that were but made are you but saying that he's lying and his version of events it's very important viewers will want to know the public will want to know your mean, mps will want to of know course, of course. he is on the record saying under oath you are lying that you were warned about this event and you went ahead anyway that you knew that i can it tell was, you it categorically was categorically that nobody told me and nobody nobody said that uh this was something that was against the rules that was a breach of the of the COVID rules, or we were doing something that wasn't a a work event, because uh, frankly, I don't think uh, I can't imagine why on earth it would have gone ahead, or why it would have been allowed uh, to go ahead. I, my, my memory of this event, as I said, is going out into the garden for about 25 minutes for what I implicitly thought was a uh, a work event, uh, and talking to staff, thanking staff. Um, I, I, I can't remember exactly how many, but for about 25 minutes I was there. I then went back to my, uh, my office and continued my work. Um, you know, I, I do humbly apologise to people for uh, misjudgments that were made, but that is the, the very, very best of my recollection about this event. That's what I've, uh, I've said to, to the inquiry. We'll have to see what they, what they say. Are good? Yeah. Let's move. Dominic Lawson wrote in the Sunday Times that, that, as well, you had been told by two officials it was a party and should be cancelled. You were dismissive. He writes, you said they were overreacting, said Martin Reynolds was your loyal Labrador. Is that also untrue? Look, I, I've told you, uh, and I, I repeat, I'm deeply sorry for misjudgments that were, that were, that were made. Your and, misjudgments? And yes, if, uh, because ultimately... Because it seems like you're trying Beth, to pass the buck I, and blame other no, people. No, I carry, I carry full responsibility for, for what took place. But nobody told me, uh, I can absolute, I'm absolutely categorical about this, nobody said to me, this is an event that is against the rules, uh, that is in breach of uh, what we're asking everybody else to do, I should not go ahead. What I remember is going out into that garden for a, a short time and uh, for 25 minutes or so, 
thanking staff who had worked on COVID, who were continuing to work on COVID, and then going back to my to my office. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so, uh, so so first of all, let me comment on the, on the dress. Just that there might be some people going, why, why, why is his tie like that? Is that some strange kind of Oxford knot or, or uh, uh, you know, club idea? You know, is that anyway, it, it's only because he's at a hospital. So he's tucked it in there because one of the things we know is when people wear ties in hospitals, the ties drag on all kinds of stuff and they actually carry a whole bunch of disease uh, and bugs around people. So that's why he's tucked his tie in. Anyway, statement analysis. He says, absolutely categorically, nobody told me it was a breach, which doesn't mean they didn't tell him something else. They just didn't tell him it was a it was a breach. And again, we'll hear elements of this later on where he's kind of bargaining uh, around around that. Anyway, then what I would think is he hides time essentially and and he says what i remember is going into that garden so there's there's some element there where we don't hear what happened between nobody telling him a breach and then um him remembering going into the garden what happened in between what did cummings tell him other than this is a breach. I, I have some ideas that we can talk about later on. Uh, again, invoking the idea of memory, as Chase says there, and then that garden. That seems to me to be distancing. You know, it's it's the it's the gardens at number ten. It's 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 his garden. It's uh, it's the prime minister's garden. Um, so so it's not that garden so that's all i got oh and then um 25 minutes or so well how long like exactly how long you're prime minister you can probably have a good judgment of time you look after a country how long how long was it so there's some issues there uh chase what do you got on this one yeah i'm sitting in that office right now yeah <laughs> <laughs> at that house yeah so it sounds funny Sounds really funny. And it implies a lack of ownership, which I think internally to him, probably at a subconscious level, uh, there's a lack of responsibility. And so when there's those two things go together, the words that people use change. And I completely agree with that. There's a lack of denial. And, and this is a bad sign in any interview at all. And it's not owning this misjudgment. And I think he's defaulting to not knowing the rules, but I think the prime minister is kind of like the president here where you should damn well know that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm no expert. But there's some very bad signs of deception here. I think he's honest again when he's discussing that he didn't hear those precise words again. And so one thing you're going to pick up on here, if you're going to pick up on something small about this behavior, is that during this one clip, if you take a look, and the one that you just watched before this, his eye home, the place where his eyes usually travel to recall information, is about 7 o'clock. Whether or not we know if that's a truthful eye home or not yet is, is to be determined. But keep that in mind that that normal location that we've so far seen in two videos is about seven o'clock and you might see something different in the future. Greg? I, I think that seven o'clock may have to do with how he's feeling when he's talking about it, because it could be emotional. Hey, I better be careful. This is a minefield. And we're back to the same message. It was work. It was work. When, when they quote a source and say at the Sunday Times, his blink rate goes through the roof because now he's going to be asked to call another person a liar. That never works very well when you're going to get multiple people who can corroborate whether you're telling the truth or not. I also agree what I call telling the truth without being honest. He does very clearly. He says, hey, nobody ever told me that exactly. <clears throat> At misjudgments were made. He's in passive voice, which means it wasn't me. The more interesting thing here, Mark, that I think he's masterful at is when you show shame, you admit guilt. That's human nature. And we're going to see that later. We're going to see some shame, but he doesn't show any shame whatsoever. No chin down, no eye breaking. 
when he does break his eyes down, it's to come up with information. And he is shaking his head and eye blocking a little bit when he's called out on that times thing. Often, I think, Scott, you talked about earlier the confirming nod. I think sometimes it can be, how did I get here? That's what the, the head shake can be. How did I end up in this situation? Um, and then finally, he says the words, nobody said to me, and he stops. Nobody said those words. I think that leaves something. Look at his pupils. He's got pretty good pupil dilation going on here. And then he's doing what I call holy ground. I'm taking holy ground. I must be okay because I was doing work for the people I worked. And then I went back to the office to deal with COVID issues. Oh, these were people who had worked on COVID. He's taking holy ground. He's taking high, higher ground. And he's not showing any shame. So it's an interesting use of all these terms. And his hands are behind his back. And he is not giving up a lot of information. Scott? What do you got? Yeah, I totally agree. Well, the heavy breathing is due to probably that mask and is he's getting into he's not in panic mode yet, but man, he's on his way. His fight or flight is on. Yeah, here it comes, man. So every time he goes back to that, you're right. Every time he goes back to that, um, his prepared statements, that head goes down, the eyes go down and he, and he breaks eye contact and starts talking again. And um, just like in the first video. And again, he's regulating with those uh with those head juts, those are uh, illustrators and regulators at the same time. More illustrators, I'm going to say the regulation was was more when he was looking away. And uh, we get a lot of categorically. So in the, in, the, in the last video, he was saying as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start using categorically, categorically more often starting today. And what will happen with words like that is you'll be you'll hang around with somebody and you'll pick up a word like that. almost like a word virus which is something I learned from Greg. And it, you'll, somebody says dude all the time, then you'll start saying dude if you hang out in that group of people that start saying it. So they kind of flip you a little a little word virus and you'll start using it too. And other people hear you do it and it's an odd change to your thing, but they get used to it and they may start using it as well. So I'm going to start using categorically here. So uh, if we're ready, categorically, we'll move right on. Paul Nick Lawson wrote in the Sunday Times that, that as well, you had been told by two officials it was a party and should be cancelled. You were dismissive, he writes. You said they were overreacting. Said Martin Reynolds was your loyal Labrador. Is that also untrue? Look, I, I've told you, uh, and I, I repeat, I'm deeply sorry for misjudgments that were, that were, that were made. Your and, misjudgments? And yes, if, uh, because ultimately... Because it seems like you're trying Beth, to pass the buck I, and blame no, other people. No, I carry, I carry full responsibility for, for what took place. But nobody told me, uh, I can absolute, I'm absolutely categorical about this, nobody said to me, this is an event that is against the rules, uh, that is in breach of uh, what we're asking everybody else to do, uh, should not go ahead. What I remember is going out into that garden for a, a short time, and uh, for 25 minutes or so, thanking staff who'd worked on COVID, who were continuing to work on COVID, and then going back to my, to my office. Is good? Yeah. Mm. Categorically. Mr. Commons was your closest and advisor and he said he verbally warned you about this. Is he lying? I, 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 I can't believe uh, that we would have gone ahead with an event that uh, people were saying was against the rules or against uh, but you're not what saying we were he asking didn't people warn to you. do. And, you're then and, not saying he didn't and warn you. nobody warned me that it was against the rules. I can, I'm absolutely categorical about that because I would, I would remember that. All right, Chase, what do you got? This interviewer does a awesome job of raising the stakes and raising the stakes before a question is answered or during the entire process. Raising the stakes is great to do in anything. You're interviewing a babysitter that's going to watch your kids. You're talking to somebody who's going to join your company. Raising the stakes means you're going to open the valve on nonverbal behaviors of deception all the way. So stakes are very important. If there's no stakes and you just have to convince a stranger that, uh, you know, you own an Android instead of an iPhone, you won't care. And there won't be signs of deception. The stakes matter a lot when it comes to behavior. And this interview does a great job doing that. He's using tons of team pronouns. We, us, they, people, all kinds of pronouns, just distancing like crazy from himself. There's big teams. You'll see him shift to self pronouns most of the time when it's talking about something he's accomplished or something that he's working on. But in the, he retreats into this minutia, this tiny little details that are not important at all. But if this happens to you, my recommendation is to go down into the depths with them. If they go down into the minutia, then dive down into the details with them. And one 
pro tip. I haven't said that in a few videos now. Let's do a pro tip. When somebody displays nonverbals like this, this is the reverse of what you're learning here on our channel. We're teaching you how to see something on the outside that's going on on the inside, but the opposite's also true. If we can manipulate the outside, then we can control parts of the inside. So the body can control the mind in many ways. So it's kind of the opposite. You don't want closed off positions for too long. And this is kind of a closed off position. The brachial arteries are uh, very protected. The hands are behind the back. So you don't want people, if you're in sales or anything else, you don't want them doing this. So hand them something, get them to grab it, show them something where they have to lean forward and let go of their arms behind their back or get them to narrate with their body through questioning and get them to illustrate or demonstrate something. So you want to change that behavior before you start getting to more important parts of the conversation. That went a little long. Apologize. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so I agree. He's he's locked off and it's allowing him to become a little pedantic. And it's easy to go down that pedantic route of, of the detail that he wants to get into. And I'll give you a way in a second to kind of get out of that. But here's how uh, kind of how he's being pedantic against the rules or against the, and then he takes a big in breath because he's about to say something that could get him into trouble or get closer to the truth. But he takes that in breath in order to have, in order to be inspired. Okay. He literally takes in breath. He inspires in order to get more oxygen to the brain so we can get the right message out. And he says what we were asking people to do. Now, it's not very clever what he says there, but it's better than what he was about to say. I'm not entirely sure what he was about to say, but I can I can have a little bit of a guess in that the, the, the pedanticness here is about the rules. Yeah, I didn't do anything against the rules. Well, the big question here is, I understand that you possibly didn't break the rules, but did you break the spirit of the rules. Now that's a different thing because the spirit of it suggests that you were doing something potentially not morally right with the society. I mean, as we're going to find out later on, maybe not even being really truly patriotic in this moment, maybe not being in it all together with the rest of the country, essentially. And so the idea of when you've got somebody who's being pedantic and saying, well, you know, it wasn't really the rule or that's not what's written down, you can go to the idea, you know, but was it, is it really in keeping with the idea that we had? That we'd, I know we wrote that as a rule, but really is it in keeping with the idea or the spirit? of the law or the spirit of the idea that we had. That's where I would like the interviewer to potentially go here, though she's doing a magnificent uh, job here. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I don't think um, he was, he was maybe told that it was against the law, what he was doing, but I think Cummings potentially said, you know what, this could look bad. Optically, it's not going to look right. I don't think it's the right thing to do, but maybe didn't ever say, hey, I think it'll break the law. I just don't think it's, I think it's against the rules. So I think that's the, so essentially it's a judgment error. There's an error of judgment and he was probably advised on that error of judgment. Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. The thing that bugs me about this is he never uses Cummings name. This is the shot where he should say, wait a minute, hang on a second. This guy's lying. He's a liar. This isn't true. We never see that. I know Chase brought it up earlier. He never used his name. He never said, hey, man, hang on a second. This guy's lying. Go get him. I'll tell you right in front of him. Let's do this. Right. Let's get him in here. Let's talk about this. Never. And this is his shot right there. It's the first time he can lean into it hard and say no. Um, again, he, when he uh, when he tries to get back to his specific points and using his illustrators on those specific points, looks down to the right and comes back up and starts talking, then he comes back up. Now, his eye flutter in this is fascinating because it looks just like our dog Hattie when we give her a bath. Because his, And Hattie doesn't want water or soap in her eyes, so she's all, she blinks the whole time and is moving around doing that. That's what that reminded me of here. And he tries to regain control again by looking away, start to talk and use that as his regulator, then looking back up and, and shooting his points out one one by one as he just his head forward as, as illustrators. And, and of course, we're hearing categorically again, it's really short and small, but it's still in there. Um, so that's right. Categorically, Greg, what do you have? Well, categorically. Um, so a couple of things. You brought up a great one. 
When you take prisoners, if you leave their hands tied behind their back for long periods of time, and Chase, I'm sure you've dealt with this too, you end up with respiration problems with those guys because your body is not designed to breathe with your hands tied behind your back. In fact, in my days of like cuffing you between your legs, it caused even more respiratory distress if you left them very, very long. Even if you're doing it to yourself, you're creating an artificial restriction on your rib cage and your diaphragm. So you'll notice it even more. If you watch his respiration rate, it's up. His head goes down and his throat protects his, I mean, his chin protects his throat. You can't miss it. He breaks eye contact. Then he uses words <clears throat> like disbelief. He says, I can't believe that that would have gone ahead. He eye blocks it. I would have remembered. Well, come on. Well, what he's doing here is creating this sense of, well, that can't be true. But we always say clusters matter more than anything. So let's take into account what he says. The clusters are passive voice. The clusters are team pronouns. The clusters are eye blocking. The clusters are disbelief. Hmm. Not, no, I didn't, this didn't happen. Nobody told me that this did not happen. None of that. So there's not a strong positive denial. None of those things that we typically look for when a person's being honest. And the respiration up, yeah, part of it's because his arms are behind his back. But the other part's because there's some fight or flight rising up in him now. And we always talk about chaff and redirect. He's starting to chaff. But the problem is he's throwing out minutia that is so easy to wade through that she just walks right into him and she gives him even more reason to get fight or flight in the next one. It's a great one. Great interview. Mr. Thomas was your closest and advisor and he said he verbally warned you about this. Is he lying? I, 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 I can't believe uh, that we would have gone ahead with an event that uh, people were saying was against the rules or against uh, but you're not what saying we're he asking people warn to you. do. You're and, then not and, saying he didn't and warn you. And nobody warned me that it was against the rules. I can, I'm absolutely categorical about it because I would, I would remember that. All right. I propose we do this. Uh, from now on, when Greg does this, Let's all three do that too. Let's start without saying, not laughing and just do that too. Okay, so if Sue Gray uncovers a different version of events and it emerges you did mislead Parliament, will you resign? We'll have to see what, what she says. And uh, I, I think that she should be given the, the space to get on and conclude her inquiry. And I would urge everybody who has uh, knowledge of this and understand, you know, memories of this to, uh, to tell her what they know. So you'd like her to interview Dominic Cummins? You know, it's, it's not for me to decide who she's got it, to interview, but just, I think everybody who has memories of these events uh, should tell her what they know. I think I'll go first on this one. Um, the head lean, oh, when, he, when she says Sue Gray, that's, I think he's kind of shocked that he heard that name, and so he's getting ready for what's going to happen. It's kind of uh, more fodder for his, his uh, fight or flight, so he's getting into panic mode. And she hits a hot spot here because his... his voice starts speeding up a little bit, his cadence uh, increases a little bit, his voice gets a little bit louder, and, uh, and, and you, can, you, can see, you can just feel it in there. You can feel it in the room after all these building up on him. Illustrating still though, heavily with those, with those head juts as he, as he gets his specific points of, uh, across. We see shoulder shrugs in key spots where he should just be uh, speaking normally and look if his arms are behind his back like that he should be telling you what's happening and, and with his chin up and giving it to you straight but at this point he's having doubts about what he's saying maybe not doubts about what he's saying but doubts if he should be saying it or not as it's because the the little shoulder shrugs really quick a shoulder shrug should last about a second where you see those little pops like that are just one that indicates that person's not sure about what they're saying or and it can be if there are other clusters around it seen as as part of a cluster of, of deceptive gestures, I guess. So um, his blink rate is steady, but about halfway through it speeds up some because she's really, he, he's he really starting to feel the heat here. So this is when we, we, we start seeing the panic start to turn on a little bit. It was at, at one or two earlier, I think we've hit about a three, three and a half at this point. So, and also when she said, should, should she uh, interview Dominic Cummins, he should have said, yeah, man, yeah, get him in here. She should talk to him. You bet you she should talk to him right now. Call her up. I'll call her up. I got her number. I'm the PM. Are you kidding me? Yeah, call her up. Let's do that. Tell her to do that. If I don't get her, you tell her. And talk to him about it. I want to be there. I want to be there and look at him when he's saying that. None of that at all. Never says his name. Never brings his name up at all. So overall, his head's down. He's, he's swinging for dear life like a fighter at this point. He's starting to he's starting to uh, get in that panic mode where not only is he he's not going to come unglued, but because he, he's looked pretty professional. But at this point, we're starting to see the little leaks in, in his body language that show he's he's being beat up 
by this interview. All right, Chase, what do you got? I agree with you. There's a lot of visual words here. <laughs> and if you are a subscriber, you should have picked up on that by now, or you probably picked up on that. There's a whole lot of visual words. We're talking about seeing and uh, looking at stuff. And there's a non-answer statement in here, which is another piece of a cluster, which the visual words are not. But the strongest uh, single shoulder shrug, like Scott was talking about several of them in here, the strongest one that I was able to measure was right when uh, he's being here, he's saying that Sue should be given all the space that she needs. And there's a big one right there. There's a lot of mention here about memory. And he's going back to this theme of memory is, is the problem, this whole thing. And this should be feeding the interviewer's style of phrasing and word choices going forward. It doesn't. Uh, I wish we could, we should do a course for interviewers. That would be awesome. But his strategy is now on the table. So we have memory, rules, and specifics. So those are the things that she should be targeting and, and dwindling into or like drilling down into or helping to explain it away so that more information comes out in the end. That's all I got for that one. Greg? Yeah, he starts off by his eyes widening when she says the word resign. And then you see his eyes widen. That's kind of some contained shock when she says Sue. But his fight or flight is up. You can't miss it. You're starting to see his respiration increase. And then he uses a little bit of a chaff and redirect by simply saying, let's not try to do her job for her. He's giving her the authority. He's making everything. He's he, Mark, your, your dog pushing the ball. He's kicking the can down the road is all he's doing. He's buying time because if he can push it down the road a ways, he can deal with that later. And I'll leave it at that. I won't put a lot more. You can see his respiration up. You can see that fight or flight is real for him now and that he is starting to lose that forward thinking brain. So we'll see how that changes in a couple of, in a couple of clips. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, absolutely correct. The, the um, uh, deflection to an inquiry is kind of a stock in trade of this kind of situation is, is you simply go, look, there's an inquiry in process. It would be wrong for me to talk about this. They, they need to talk to whoever they need to talk about. I should not get involved in this. In fact, I'm just not going to comment on it. And it's a great way of, again, kicking the can down the road, hitting the ball into the long grass and getting back onto message. And he will get there eventually. I think we see a little kind of optimistic bounce in him by the end. So though I absolutely agree, there's panic there, there's fight and flight. I think he actually thinks this bit goes a little better for him because he's managed to deflect into a classic piece of spin, which he'll have done time and time again. It's not the first time he or another prime minister has said, hey, we, we need to see the results of the inquiry. So this is classic. What I think is very clever about what he does is, again, he goes, everybody that has memories should tell her what they know. Well, he's already decided, I mean, really, you should look, anybody who has evidence should tell her what they, no, there is no such thing as evidence in this situation. There's only memories. And he's, and he's socializing this idea of any evidence that's given forward is actually just a memory. And like we all know, we all forget and we, our memories get corrupted and, and people remember this different. And, you know, Greg's truth is not my truth. You know, there's all kinds of elements in there like that. So he socializes the idea of memories rather than facts. And then we get a little bounce on him. And I think he's actually quite pleased by that one because it's a, it's a, it's, it's not a bad move that could work for him further down the line. And actually watch out for that one. See whether he does that in a few days time. Uh, whether, you know, he, he puts forward the idea that some people's memories are probably better than others and they're not real fact or evidence of this. Okay. So if Sue Gray uncovers a different version of events and it emerges you did mislead Parliament, will you resign? We'll have to see what, what she says. and. Uh, I, I think that she should be given the, the space to get on and conclude her inquiry. And I would urge everybody who has uh, knowledge of this and understand, you know, memories of this to, uh, to tell her what they know. So you'd like her to interview Dominic Cummins? Uh, you know, it's, it's not for me to decide who she's got if, to interview, but I think everybody who has memories of these events uh, should tell her what they know. Mark, you don't get the 1500 bucks. 
for 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 mentioning the truth. <laughs> well, we, we are going to do it. Nobody gets to fifteen hundred bucks. Oh, really? <laughs> no. well, I you have to clasp your out. hands. You have to clasp your hands and, and oh, yeah. sell it, man. No, and I'm the sorry, next thing you know, you'll have to. Think he'll be giving you a new condition. I didn't see the contract, <laughs> but I think I followed the spirit of the contract, and so. I think in nobody good, told me I had to hold my hands. <laughs> in good you call, faith, you should pay me the money. You need to call Vivo. You need. Call, I'll take Barnes and we'll fry right. it out. All right. For fifteen hundred bucks. I'll see bucks. you. I'll, uh, I'll see you in court. I'm not ruling out that you will have to resign if you've misled Parliament. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is that we need to. You've asked me what I'm. What I'm focused on what I want to do, what I want to do. No, I asked you, is, if, you, is mess, to, if you, it's found that Sue Gray finds you misled Parliament, will you resign? That's what I'm asking you, yeah. you're not answering. Well, I, what, I, what I'm saying to, to you with the deepest respect, Beth, is that we've got to wait for the outcome of the, uh, of the report. But in the meantime, I'm focused on delivering here uh, at this fantastic community diagnostics hub, uh, run by people from the, from the Royal Free, but offering mm. an amazing service. What we're, I'm focused on Number one is clearing the COVID backlogs and, and delivering on all our priorities for the British people. Uh, we, we've, we've still got a, a problem with COVID. We've still got 16,000 people in, in beds. And since I, I've got the, uh, you know, um, I'm in front you, of the cameras, I, I must remind people that it's a great thing to do uh, to get a booster. And I, I've we've got, got a couple and of questions. We, we've got to do, I, I we've, got, we've still got a lot of people who do you, could get okay, protected and, and let me just try protected. one more time do you accept on principle that a prime minister if he's found to have misled parliament has to stand down from office what i'm telling you beth and i you know i'll repeat this is that uh, i think that you're slightly anticipating things uh, they'll, they'll, i will come back to parliament uh, with a full account and okay. uh, when the inquiry reports but it would be quite wrong of me to anticipate uh, or prejudge whatever the inquiry may conclude just, just mark what do you got yeah, I mean, it's, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. There's so much in that. Let me cover a, a little bit of it that most appeals to me. Um, he almost answers the question. So at the start, he almost answers the question and then he inspires again and he remembers the spin. And it's a beautiful piece of spin. And it's execute. If, if this weren't such an important issue, we'd probably let him do it. <laughs> And probably Rigby would let him do it, but this is too important an issue. And and so he says, what you've asked me is is what I'm focused on. And of course, she didn't ask him that. She didn't ask him that. And Rigby is a demon here. And she heads straight in there and she does not let him do that piece of spin, which is a, which is a wonderful piece of spin. If he's just going to go, he's just going to reframe the question completely and get on message. She doesn't let, let him do it. Um, he then takes the question, but then does deflect again to the inquiry and then brings it again, brilliant piece of spin, deflects to the inquiry and then brings it to the present state. What we're delivering here, so now he's like back in the room, something else happening here. It's a great maneuver and it is executed, I think, by him quite well. And he'd get away with it if Rigby wasn't there and being a total demon at this and, and doing the public a great service by hanging on to this one and keeping on um, hitting him around that. So brilliantly done there. Um, by the end, as she hammers him and hammers him and will not let it go, we see him stamp both feet. He's angry now. And what I want you to do is keep that in mind because in our next video, I think he's gonna try and convince you that he has other feelings and I want you to hang on to that idea of anger because he's angry right now, very definitely. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. This is where he's got his head down like a fighter, but he's being clobbered, man. It's like those old uh, Muhammad Ali films where you watch those where he's just, he's just standing there letting somebody wail on him. But this guy's just getting wailed on. <laughs> it's, just, it's just happening. Uh, so you know who this interviewer is, Mark? Uh, yeah, um, uh, Beth Rigby, uh, Cambridge, mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, to uh, him, who's Oxford. Uh, so it is an Oxford and Cambridge uh, battle uh, okay. going on here. Uh, one is a, is a hapless toff, and the other is from East Anglia. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there is. Oh man, there's a little bit of potential kind of class warfare going on as well. Okay, because yeah, because I. 
I didn't know who it was. I, of course, uh, not from there, so I don't know who, that, who, who she was. But anyway, he's uh, like you were saying, he tries not to, not only to rephrase the question, but he just changes it, and she's not having it at all, not even a little bit. And she goes on even stronger. She stops him, and she tells him, asks him the question again, tells him what it was. Then he left hooks her with that Dale Carnegie style, using her first name and 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 then saying you know with greatest respect and it works on her you know she she shuts down for a minute and i think she you know it was his big left hook and she regains her her head and comes back at him but it works for a couple of seconds there and then he goes into another redirect and it, of course it's just a, a show from there on uh, but overall i think at this point he's fighting for his life as a as a prime minister to see if he can keep that going that's where i think he's he's his biggest thing is greg what do you got yeah, if you're playing bingo, now is the time because he starts off with a matador. He tries to dodge that question, but quickly, quickly goes into chained elephant and starts dancing around and then turns into a, a worm on a griddle and a squirrel in the road. He's got nowhere to go and he realizes it and he's in real trouble. His breathing goes through the roof. You can't miss it. You can watch his body rise. Here's a great one. Go back and look at video one and then look at this video and look at his eyelids. His lower lids have drooped. He's under high pressure right now. When that lower lid droops, it's a good indicator that you're under high pressure. He's stammering because his brain is out of gear. He's not sure what to say. He can't even really, and this guy is pretty clearly spoken and enunciates all of his letters. Respect doesn't come out as respect. It comes out as respect. And it doesn't have the T at the end. You can't miss it. Then he leans in and he starts to do exactly what, Mark, you're, you're saying. He's trying to redirect this conversation in his way. Wait. Meantime, here, focused. That's a great and beautiful redirection because what he's done now is allow himself to get back onto the COVID issue and back onto the holy ground and back onto people. Exactly what we saw, again, Bill Clinton do in the Monica Lewinsky thing. Now I've got work to do for the American people. But she don't let him go and she goes after him again. And when she goes after him that time, his skin gets pink. So he's blushing. He's showing that she's got him. This guy's not got anywhere to go from here. And this one is really, really showing a lot of stress. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with y'all. It, it's incredible that he just invents a question. I know y'all said that. But I just thought this amazing, amazing. So if you are honest and innocent of something, it would not be wrong at all to prejudge what an inquiry would conclude about you or what an investigation would conclude about you. This is the reason why bait questions work. And a bait question is, is there any reason blank and blank would happen asking somebody to prejudge something or, or guess something? So he uses her name twice during this one clip here. And I think it's uh, may, might be an attempt to take back some control. I think it would be more effective if he was not standing there with his hands behind his back like a kid uh, and actually did take control. And he's redirecting back to COVID and didn't even ask about this. So if you're the interviewer and this happens, you just mention briefly what they're talking about and go right back to your question. So she could have said something like, um, yeah, here at the hospital, there's a lot going on. So, and then right, it's just a quick statement that says, I just heard what you said, and then right back to the statement. That's very effective. So he talks about problems with we, and he talks about solving them with I. All throughout this, this clip here, there's a double shoulder shrug, a double shrug at the word deepest respect. And you can take a look at this. This shows us the apologetic nature of this behavior. When somebody says, oh, I don't know, like, have you seen my car keys? And your spouse might go, I'm not sure. That's almost an apologetic movement of our bodies. And I think uh, there's a chance that Mark and I may disagree here, which I think is always fun. I don't think any of us have ego about this. I kind of do when people disagree with me, <laughs> but uh, I know Mark doesn't. I think when he's stomping forward toward her, he's using her name. And I think it's uh, there is some territory there. And I think that... That was made possible because he was back on his heels, metaphorically and figuratively throughout this. So she did put him back on his heels. And I think that was his like coming down. But I do think there was some some kind of a, a little dominance attempt there with, with the stomp there. So, yeah, that's all I got. So, Mark, you going to take that shit off him or what? <clears throat> no, 
No, I agree. Categorically. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't see, <laughs> right, because you don't see his preparation for that stomp. So he has to be already on to on his heels. Uh, and I think, but I would still stand, so I agree, and I would stand by, you hear them come down. So there has to be extra force in that. He has to yeah, have put yeah, some yeah. extra musculature into that to create that sound. And that, and, and I think I agree it's territorial because he makes the sound to go, get out of my territory, to hear that loud noise. I'm big dog, get out the way. Yeah. You're not ruling out that you will have to resign if you've misled Parliament. Well, I mean, what I'm saying is that we need to, you've asked me what I'm, what I'm focused on or what I want to do, what I want to do. No, I asked you, is, if, you, you mess, to, if you, it's found that Sue Gray finds you've misled Parliament, will you resign? That's what I'm asking you, yeah. you're not answering. Well, I, what, I, what I'm saying to, to you with the deepest respect, Beth is that we've got to wait for the outcome of the uh, of the report. But in the meantime, I'm focused on delivering here uh, at this fantastic community diagnostics hub, uh, run by people from the from the Royal Free, but offering mm. an amazing service. What we're, I'm focused on, number one, is clearing the COVID backlogs and and delivering on all our priorities for the British people. Uh, we, we've we've still got a. A problem with COVID. We've still got 16,000 people in in beds, and since I, I've got the you know um, I'm in front you, of the cameras, I, I must remind people it's a great thing to do uh, to get a booster. And I, I've we've got, got a couple and of questions. We, we've got, I, do, I we've got, we've still got a lot of people who you, could get okay, protected. And, let me and just to get try protected. one more time. Do you accept on principle that a prime minister, if he's found to have misled Parliament, has to stand down from office? What I'm telling you, Beth, and I you know I'll repeat this is that uh, I think that you're slightly anticipating things, uh, the, the, I will come back to Parliament uh, with a full account and okay. uh, when the inquiry reports, but it would be quite wrong of me to anticipate uh, or prejudge whatever the inquiry may conclude. Just, just it's like, it's just funny how, how we disagree with each other and then we figure out that we're talking about the same <laughs> Yeah. That's, the way, that's the way I can spin these things. I'll see you in the see you in the backyard later. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I've got one final thing on this before we move to COVID. This because this is important. This is the first time we've seen you since reports emerged uh, in the Daily Telegraph, not denied by Down the Street, about two boozy parties held in the garden in the buildings of Number Ten the night before Prince Philip's funeral, when the country was in national mourning. Was having to apologise to the Queen about those parties the night before she put her husband of over 70 years, she laid him to rest. Was that a moment of shame for you? I, I, I deeply and, and bitterly regret uh, that, 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 that that happened. And I can only uh, you know, and renew my apologies both to, uh, to Her Majesty and uh, to the country uh, for, for misjudgments that, that, that were made and, and for which I take full responsibility. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this... I said earlier, Mark, that he could have shown some shame, but to show shame means that you're also accepting that you've done something wrong. So he's been masterful through all the rest of this at not showing shame. Here he's showing shame. And this is classic shame we associated, breaking eye contact, putting your chin down. We can't see his chin to see any emotion in his chin, blocking his eyes, shaking his head. That's what we associate with shame. And he should be ashamed in this case. I, I actually had written on my notes, this is his, Andrew here hold my beer moment doing something this <laughs> foolish in to your point Mark you're going to talk about patriotism not being a Brit not being someone who lives in that country I've always been told she is the personification of the country not just a person so that's a big deal it's a much bigger deal than it is to Americans who we think our politicians are all nuts and kind of whatever so it, it's a big deal. But he's got this exasperation and explosive breath. I can only imagine him having to talk to the queen and her going, what? What were you doing? What were you thinking? And that's probably why we're seeing some real shame here. He does emotional eye accessing, his shoulders rise, his volume drops, which is the first time we've heard that. His volume drops, his brain's out of gear. And this is what the rest of his stuff should have looked like, which is why I give him credit, Mark, for being very smart about not showing shame in those other videos. Because if he did, we would know exactly what it looks like from this baseline. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. This rocking back and forth is making him look off balance because it's literally doing that. And it's, it's a little strange. But if you listen to this again and just close your eyes when the clip plays again in a few seconds, for just a few seconds, 
The only regret is that it happened. The only regret is that it happened. Not that he did it, not that there was a part in it. Imagine someone accidentally steps on your foot or runs over your foot with their suitcase in an airport and they say, oh, I regret that that happened. Instead of, I'm sorry, I did that. It's a big difference. But there's lots of misjudgment and there's no mistakes. There's zero mistakes, a lot of misjudgment. And there's a single shrug at one of the misjudgments here in this clip, which indicates somebody lacks confidence in what in that statement or what they're saying at that time. And his breathing is increasing. You can watch it speed up from the beginning toward the end of this clip. You can watch the breathing speed up. And there's two things that we look for when it comes to breathing. We look for location, which is chest or abdomen, abdomen being comfortable, relaxed and and safe and chest being stressful, then we look for duration or uh, frequency. So how often a person is breathing. We're seeing a shift into upper chest and an increase in respiratory rate there, mostly because this activation of our uh, adrenal glands produce a temporary spike in the body's demand for oxygen. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Just like Greg's been saying this whole time, there is some serious adrenal function going on here because there's fight or flight responses and he's really getting pushed up against the ropes by this uh, amazing interviewer who's really hammering him pretty hard. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, so uh, that swinging backwards and forwards, definitely. Like he's, um, he's close to faint, I would say, within the fight and flight situation there partly done it to himself in that in that uh you know he's he, he can't breathe properly with his hands behind his back in that kind of situation um so look just so people understand the severity uh, of this the queen represents the the, the idea of, a, of being a mother, a grandmother, a loyal partner to somebody. She represents that as a country, the idea of a country being like that. Is it for any, you know, Americans watching, it's rather like if Uncle Sam were a real person who wasn't elected, they just lived forever. <laughs> And, and and you could go and talk to Uncle Sam and go, hey, Uncle Sam, what, like what what does the country say about this? What do you, the embodiment of the country, say about this? The queen, that's the idea behind the queen. And so she embodies the idea of of motherhood, of of being a great female warrior as well. You know, somebody will get you if if you anger her as well. And so if you're not, if you don't join in with her grief, you're being unpatriotic and more importantly you're not respecting other mothers and grandmothers and and wives or partners now so boris shows some elements of shame here i absolutely agree i'm unsure whether it's shame for what we think it should be shame for though you know is it shame around britain like i shouldn't have done that to Britain and the people, or is it shame around Team Boris, where like I've really messed up here? Like I, I made a big, I got caught. I made a big yeah. uh, mistake around that. Look, I I don't know, but here's what I want you to pay attention to. Look at his breathing, and I understand he's messed up his own breathing, but understand, I would suggest he's already angry. I think we're seeing angry. I do see some indicators of shame, but I see with that not the breathing of shame. His breathing doesn't change to shame. His breathing stays with anger. I think he's upset with himself that he's got caught with this and this is the shame of person the person who's been caught out and has upset team boris not necessarily team uk and the nation though some of that is speculation but check out the breathing on that one yeah and we can't tell why he's showing those symptoms just tell the symptoms are there right yeah that's for we sure we're not mind readers to scott's friend's point yeah yeah, yeah. scott what do you got on this one all right i think the whole thing's a show I don't think he feels bad about any of it. I, I don't think we're seeing shame at all. Granted, his head goes down. Granted, we get granted we get all those things that look like it. But watch what when he's when it comes to his breathing. If you're ashamed of something, you're not gonna sit there and breathe heavy for a while. No, you're gonna do big, heavy, heavy, deep breaths if you're ashamed of something. It's not gonna be a bunch of like he's doing. 
No, it's these big, heavy, deep breaths. That's when you see shame. So he's making a, a good show of it. He's trying as hard as he can. The mask makes it hard to see his facial expression, which would be, you know, he's trying to look sad and, and shameful or ashamed. But that's another reason it's so big at that point. Um, he talks more about mistakes and misjudgments. You're right, Chase. He's, he's on top of that. But I think he does say, I, I can't remember. Does he say mistakes or not? Or is this misjudgments? Uh, I think it's misjudgment. Okay, because most of the time he's saying mistakes and misjudgments. Anyway, overall, I think this whole thing was for show. I don't think he feels bad about it at all. I think he's worried about himself. Um, and he, he may be ashamed that he's in that position, but I don't think he's, I, I don't see any cues of real shame, especially around his eyes. I'm not seeing anything that shows that there. And I would say categorically, <laughs> this is fake. Okay, I've got one final thing on this before we move to COVID. This, because this is important, this is the first time we've seen you since reports emerged uh, in the Daily Telegraph, not denied by Down the Street, about two boozy parties held in the garden, in the buildings of Number 10, the night before Prince Philip's funeral, when the country was in national mourning. Was having to apologise to the Queen about those parties the night before she put her husband of over 70 years, she laid him to rest. Was that a moment of shame for you? I, I, I deeply and, and bitterly regret uh, that, 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 that that happened. And I can only uh, you know, and renew my apologies both to, uh, to Her Majesty and uh, to the country uh, for, for misjudgments that, that, that were made and, and for which I take full responsibility. Mark, question for you. Are these guys not that you would do it, but do you think it's coaching not to say mistake versus misjudgment for the British audience? Wondering. Uh, yeah, so pri prime ministers can have can make misjudgments, but mistakes um, are tougher because because you, because yeah, that's yeah, um, because you can have people could be unconfident with you if you make mistakes, whereas misjudgments, you recognize that. And just finally, do you think you'll be prime minister by the end of the year? I, I'm focused, if I may say so, Beth, I know you want to take it uh, back to, to, to me and my career and all the rest, but I am focused completely on delivering for the people of this, of this country, uh, getting us through COVID. Uh, we've had the fastest booster rollout of any European country. We've got the most open economy. That's because of the hard work of everybody in government, amazing work of the NHS, all the doctors and nurses up and down the country. And, and that's, that's who I'm here to support and to thank. And, and what we're also doing is rolling out to boost, to, to, to bust the backlogs. What we're doing is rolling out the community diagnostics uh, hubs. And, and this is an amazing example. Uh, you've got patients who can come in, uh, get screened, get scanned, get tested fast and uh, you cut out a huge amount of delay. 80% of the, of the backlog delays is caused by people who can't get to see a consultant or can't get the scan that they need in time. Well, we're, we're trying to fix that by making scan, scanning and screening more accessible and faster to, to speed up the process. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. All right, Chase, what do you got? We, I'm just excited we finally get to see his hands. <laughs> finally the hands come out but when they do there's no palm exposure they're rapid they have jerky movement and they immediately retreat back behind the back one thing that i found interesting here is that the right arm before we saw his hands was tighter than normal so it was kind of raised up a little bit so when people's hands are behind their back clasping them behind the back doesn't always mean that much but when the person starts reaching up and grabbing onto the opposite arm, and I think this is from the first book on body language. It was written by a guy named Julius Fast. And this indicates a person being uh, restraint, self-restraint of grabbing the arm behind the back. I was wondering, can't see it. I'm wondering if that might be what we were seeing here in this, in this video. I love how he acknowledges the question and then just answers his own made up one i think that's fabulous and this is the first time that we also see him being expressive he's using his eyebrows for the first time for real here so his eyebrows are moving more than anything his voice tone is fluctuating more than anything and he knows i think that he knows the the saber-toothed tiger 
interviewer is about to leave the area. He's about to be safe. So he's more comfortable and more relaxed in this environment. That's why we see it. And he's finally getting to a point where the rehearsed COVID message of what this building is finally coming out. So he's more confident with that message than anything else. And that's, I think, what we're seeing right here. Scott, what do you think? All right. I think this is his closer and he knows it. So, yeah, I agree with you 100 percent. He sees it coming. And so what happens is his blink rate drops, man. It's like 23 times in in that first minute there. Once she asks the questions, I think I counted 23 times. His voice tone is not only strong here, man, he starts getting loud because it's just like if you go to those little karaoke things at the end of the song, somebody stand there singing borderline, or they get the end of it, man. They're like all into it and they start screaming borderline real cool and real loud and they start doing all their stuff because it's here comes the end. You know, it's almost over. So his volume's way up, his cadence speeds up, and he's leaning into it almost like at a, at a marching cadence because you're right, this is where he's he's selling his prepared statement. All he's got as the prime minister, here's all the things he's doing, and he's sounding like a leader at this point. First time, the whole time he's been doing this, where he's actually, actually sound like he's in control because he knows nothing's coming after this. You know, so he's, he's leaning into it real hard. Illustrating really hard with that head still, just like bang, bang, bang with all of his words. And then he chaffs and redirects uh, and gets into to all the, uh, the the stuff that we're, you know, here's what we're doing. It's amazing. Is it amazing? All the stuff, you know, everybody else is doing that too. It's, it's, it's amazing. We're amazed. So I think this is his, his bow to like, thank you very much. This is great. Good night, everybody. We'll see you. Thanks, Cleveland. We'll see you next time. That's what I think we're looking at. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I love the when she asked the the hard question, "Will you be prime minister in the year?" Some explosive yeah. expo <laughs> that that exasperation blows his hair up. By the way, it's funnier than hell. You just see that mask push away and all that. He could have just said, "No, no, I don't think so." At this rate, and it would have sent about the same message. Then he goes into changing to your point. He chaffs and chaffs and chaffs and chaffs and chaffs, and then he takes on holy ground. This is all about serving the people. I it, this is classic politician. I got my redirect. Now I'm going to go on the message and I'm going to use my hands and do everything I'm supposed to do and talk. That's what I see. Uh, Mark, what do you have? Yeah. So his initial response to that, uh, that question, I think we, uh, I think we probably see a vomit response from him. Actually. I think we saw the, the, it come forward and the, and the lips come forward. I don't know. Check out underneath that mask. I think we see vomit response there. It was <laughs> throws up in his own mask. <laughs> And then expels air uh, to to rebalance himself, uh, to rebalance the levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide, because he's he's re he's in recovery right now. That was that was quite sure. All of that that happened before has traumatized uh, the guy, <laughs> and and he's now in a recovery state. But uh, look, he gets back to where he is literally born and trained to be, which is in rhetoric. Understand he went to Eton. Eton is the only school, to my understanding, in the UK that has rhetoric on the syllabus. It's produced 20 prime ministers. He then went to uh, Oxford, uh, which has produced, I think, 28 prime ministers. He was head of the um, of the Oxford Union, which has produced, which is the debating society. It's produced two uh, prime ministers, uh, I, I believe. So if not, if not more. So he's already on uh, Eaton. Uh, it's its assembly hall is, to my understanding, a reproduction of the Houses of Parliament. Imagine if you're a kid, and what happens is every time you walk into school assembly, you're already being got ready to rule a country. Quite extraordinary. So he gets on to his rhetoric and it's, he's very good at it, as you'd expect. He's got rules of three there. You know, get back to uh, testing. Uh, you know, I don't know what he says. Having a pizza, you know, watching great TV and fast. Like the rule of three and then fast afterwards like great stuff this is the guy that came up with the idea of brexit being oven ready like great metaphor the the departure of 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 britain from the union from the union of of, of europe could be oven ready could be as simple as popping a turkey in you know so he's he is brilliant at rhetoric he's on form here that's why he is formidable and he's been trained to be formidable and he relaxes very very quickly from this initial uh trauma here uh great uh display um but but uh rigby there 
Uh, what an adversary. What an adversary. And just finally, do you think you'll be Prime Minister by the end of the year? I, I'm focused, if I may say so, Beth, I know you want to take it uh, back to, to, to me and my career and all the rest, but I am focused completely on delivering for the people of this, of this country, uh, getting us through COVID. Uh, we've had the fastest booster roller of any European country. We've got the most open economy. That's because of the hard work of everybody in government, amazing work of the NHS, all the doctors and nurses up and down the country. And, and that's, that's who I'm here to support and to thank. And, and what we're also doing is rolling out to boost, to, to, to bust the backlogs. What we're doing is rolling out the community diagnostics uh, hubs. And, and this is an amazing example. Uh, you've got p patients who can come in, uh, get screened, get scanned, get tested fast, and uh, you cut out a huge amount of delay. 80% of the, of the backlog delays is caused by people who can't get to see a consultant or can't get the scan that they need in time. Well, we're, we're trying to fix that by making scan, scanning and screening more accessible and faster to, to speed up the process. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, it's still around the room, and uh, we'll talk about what we, what our take on the whole thing. We'll go Mark, Chase, Greg, then I'll wrap it up. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I'd never seen him grilled like that before. That's that's probably as bad as it's going to get for him. So let's see what happens out of this formidable competition. Absolutely, as Chase said, on literally on his heels, you know, up against the ropes, being hit and hit and hit. There is a recovery at the end, but that's because Rigby's leaving at that point. Chase, what do you think? I think, uh, let me just go from a behavioral psychology standpoint. I think the hospital is the perfect place to do this. Every human being is automatically wired to respond uh, to authority and to respond to commands more in a hospital because of doctors. And uh, in behavioral psychology, we call this white coat syndrome. And I think it was key. Maybe it wasn't planned, but I think it was key. And if the interviewer was wearing maybe a dress that resembled a lab coat or something like that, I didn't see what she looked like. I think that would be brilliant. And I would love to see that. But I think the hospital played a part. I think the hospital was an active participant in the results of what happened uh, in these videos that, that you just watched with us. And there's a whole lot going on where we see almost a behavioral regression being caused here. So we're seeing regression into uh, language and behavior and all kinds of things that more resemble children than adults and are way off of his baseline of being in charge and confident in exactly what he's saying all the time. Greg? Yeah, a couple of things. This weekend, I went and watched a bunch of bull riders. These are guys who ride 1,200 pound animals and are not afraid of anything, except standing in front of people. They would move to try to get comfortable. We see that here. We see, here's a guy who's usually in charge and is not going to take a whole lot, but this woman's not giving him a break. She comes right out the gate with, this guy called you a liar, is he a liar? Uh, well, that's back on your heels pretty quickly. He made some mistakes probably by holding his hands. It seems like a great idea until it starts to affect respiration. But through this, we could see his fight or flight rise. We could see him trying to avoid the question, trying to dance away. And then she finally got down to a point where she had called him a liar or many other people had called him a liar. And she's using team pronouns. We are calling you a liar, not me. So now he's got to defend himself against people that are his confidants and... Then finally, she gets to this point where I think he shows shame and where the shame is about self, about the fact he's busted or Scott, a way to deflect. At least he was smart enough not to stand with his chin up and say, yeah, I did that. Because that, to your point, Mark, would be defying a holy thing almost in, in, the, in the country. So he walks out of that and then she gives him a break as all that happens. She gives him a break and lets him go because she could have shut him down very quickly after she said, Will you be prime minister in the year? And if he says yes, she could have said, and what makes you think that? But she doesn't. She lets him have the ball so he can run back down the place so maybe he'll interview with her again. That's what I see. I think there's a lot of deception and a lot of discomfort. Scott, what do you got? All right. I think this is a great example of someone trying to control what we see. Obviously, he's got a mask on, so we can't really see what's going on in his face. 
The arms behind his back, I call that royalty arms, because you see that when someone is, is in control of large groups of people, you'll see generals do it, you'll see sergeants do it, you'll see members of the royal family do it when they're, look, when they're walking around looking at soldiers or they're looking at, or if they're in um, a museum somewhere, their arms behind their back, that makes them look royal. And, and the, royal, the royals really do that quite often, if, if you'll notice that. So I call that ro- royalty arms, and I think that's why he's using this to give himself that little, that little more of, of looking like he's important and and so to kind of um, solidify his his uh, place right there in, in the importance of what's supposed to be happening but I think it's a great example of, of watching somebody go from just uh, being you know on guard to a little bit more fight or flight kicking in a little bit more panic a little bit more panic a little bit more panic and then them like you were just saying Greg giving him the go okay man now you can go and just letting him end in the way he wanted to so it doesn't end up all 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 messy at the end so he will uh, talk to her again I think it's a great example of just seeing something just blow up and then them actually letting him run with it all right I think this is good and fellas and we'll see you next time see you